Excellent. So thank you very, very much. And it's going to be a fantastic day. Um, our first keynote um, is about to start. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to welcome Michael Feathers, uh, director of R7K Research and Conveyance, with a, tight, with a talk titled Conway's Law and You, How to Organize Your Organization for Optimum Development. Development. Thank you. Michael, there you are. OK, thank you very much. Okay. So, great to be here. I've been to Greece a couple of times, but this is the first time I've been here at a conference. And I look forward to it. It really looks like it's going to be something great to enjoy. So, topic today. Um, this is an Agile conference. I'm going to talk about Agile a bit, but through a slightly different veil than you might be used to. Um, let's go and look at something here. Anybody know what this is? Growth rings for a tree, right? It's kind of interesting when you look at tree rings, you know, cross section of a tree and try to figure out, you know, uh, how was that tree in its environment? What happened with it? And, um, you know, I think people who are basically like very well versed in this, they can look at the rings, they can basically figure out whether a particular point in history was like a rainy season, for instance. The tree grows in response to its environment. And this thing tends to be true of many things in life, including software. So I mentioned this in the title of my talk. Have you heard of this at all, Conway's Law? Raise your hands if you've heard of Conway's Law. Good, good number of people, OK? Now, the thing about Conway's Law that I think is most fascinating is that there aren't enough people that really know it. And it's kind of amazing to me because it's basically an observation about software development that came from the 1970s. There's a guy named Mel Conway who basically had an observation he made about software development. And he wrote it up and he tried to get people to publish this back in the 1970s. And of course they said, oh no, we can't let you publish this because you have no data. It's just really an observation. How do we know that this is true? And since then, universities have done many, of studies, of, many studies of design and discovered that his fundamental observation has validity in the world. So, Essentially, paraphrasing what he was saying, it's really just this. Any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. Okay? Kind of a very wordy thing to go and say, but, you know, how many people are hearing of this for the first time? Yeah, so I look at some of you and you have this look on your face like, oh, yeah, I get that. I've experienced that kind of thing, right? And um, it is something that once you hear it, you're kind of like you can filter in on all of your experience and you can understand where you've seen this in many different places. Uh, so I remember in early in my career working in one building and integrating code with another team in another building. And it was kind of amazing because when we drew diagrams showing how our systems interacted, there was always like my stuff over here and their stuff way over here. And then I actually went and moved to the other building and helped integrate things. And eventually, in the diagrams, the stuff that I was bringing across was seen as part of their system. And this was not like a conscious thing. It just had to do with the way that they saw the software, the way that they saw the teams. So there is this thing that happens in software development where if you take a group of people and you break them up into, say, maybe three or four teams, chances are you're going to have software that you can break up into three or four different pieces. Anyone know why this happens at all? It's kind of obvious when you think about it. If we have like two different teams working on something and they're kind of separated by a bit of a communication barrier, it's just going to be easier for them to work on their own stuff and figure out some way to interface with the other team. And then that interface becomes something which is, becomes concrete in the software. It's kind of like, okay, you work on this stuff, I'll work on that stuff. You present this API, I'll interact with that API. And then when you do this, you quite naturally go and have these structures within software. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can look at this when you hear about this. One is like, oh no, we're doomed, right? And I know early on when I first heard this, there were a lot of people who said this because what they realized was that as many different observations or, or ideas they had about what their architecture could be, it didn't seem to matter if they had a fixed organizational structure. The organizational structure would basically decide their architecture for them. But there's a far more optimistic view, which is that we can alter organization structure in order to go naturally produce changes in software. And that's a rather powerful thing to be aware of. 
So in this talk, I want to basically talk about some things that might be considered corollaries to Conway's law. They really have to do with this fundamental recognition that software, team, and organization, and process all mixed together in one big system. And things that happen in one of those domains tends to affect things that happen in other domains. And, you know, I don't know, this is an Agile conference, right? I've been involved in the Agile community for years. And I think that this level of design understanding is something we just really kind of fundamentally need because of the fact that, you know, we are, whether we consider it or not, really, by imposing a process or working with people, we are making design decisions. Design decisions about our organizations, about the work product we do, all these different things. And as I said, one domain affects the other. So let's look at a couple of different things. Um, I know the two guys who wrote this book, Craig Larman and Bas Vode, and uh, they basically in this book made uh, a bunch of arguments against something we're called component teams. Anybody know what a component team is at all? You have a giant software application and you have, here's a particular component, then you have a separate team that's gonna go and work in this area. And then you have other components and other components. And they made a couple of arguments going and claiming that this was really a poor way of going and doing design or systems organization. The better thing to do is something they, they called feature teams. And you'll see feature teams quite often in many agile you know, uh, environments these days. Feature teams are really all about the idea that you can have like a good, well-gelled work team and have them, have them kind of like float from one area of the system to another. They're given features and then essentially that team has to the license to basically change any part of the software they need to to make those features work, to actually go and introduce that feature in the system. And so they said, you know, this is a much better way of approaching things. And they had a couple of reasons. One is that you can end up being in this place where the developers working on a particular component, they get all this like siloed knowledge where they basically learn the ins and outs of that area, but they don't know enough about the rest of the system. So with this, people kind of rotate all over the place. The other thing too that they made as an observation was that when you have component teams uh, for any, say, sprint or iteration, there's always going to be some work which basically, uh, or some features are going to require work in some areas but not in other areas. So you have like all this extra slack time in the context of your development and that can kind of get in the way. So they had these two reasons to say that this was really a bad idea, component teams. And yay, let's move to feature teams. Now, the thing about this is that you can do this and it can work out fine. But when you think about how software interacts with people, you can recognize that there could be some problems with this. And it turns out that many of these problems are really things you can see in practice. Has anybody ever heard of something in economics called the tragedy of the commons? Okay, It's an economic theory, and it was basically uh, something articulated. I forget who first articulated it. But the notion is, like, imagine that you're in a city, and you have like a giant park and in this park, it's like anybody can do anything they want to do. You can basically do barbecue, cook meat, have your kids run around and play football and do all these things. But there's this thing that since nobody really feels like they own it or have responsibility, then people go ahead and sort of end up slowly destroying things because they don't have this sense that this is the thing I, that I belongs to me or that I can have a sense of care for. And I see this over and over again in organizations where they have this notion of a feature team that can basically touch any area of the code. And this is not something which happens like maliciously. This isn't somebody trying to be mean, but sometimes, you know, maybe your, uh, your specialty isn't working with the business logic, but you have to go in there and make changes. And just because you have a little bit of lack of knowledge in those areas, some of your changes may not be quite as good as they may be made by other people. So there's like this balance between expertise, uh, learning in a particular area that has good sides and has bad sides. So if you were to go and make a choice between feature teams and component teams, which one would you choose? Which one is better? Yeah, everybody's still saying feature teams. I thought I made a good argument against them, right? Okay, fair enough. But here's the thing, why do we have to choose? I think it's a really fascinating thing to think about. Essentially, there are benefits and liabilities to component teams. 
There are benefits and liabilities to feature teams. Why don't we just basically decide when we need to? Do we want to have, here's an area that needs some component teams, here's areas that can have feature teams? And sort of change that over time, but not change that as something that we think about in terms of what our product means in the market, but being responsive to maybe what the software needs. Is that an interesting frame to think about things? Yeah, and this is the kind of insight you get when you start to take this observation of Conway's law very seriously. So, as I was mentioning earlier, tragedy of the commons. Commons is any resource that can be used as though it belongs to all, okay? And so this is a thing that can happen in the context of that work. Um, siloed development. I mentioned this a little bit earlier briefly. The notion that essentially you can have a situation where basically people become so, so domain aware in a particular area that they end up causing a bit of trouble. Maybe they don't know the other domains as well. And this is a great reason why we want to cross-train people across different areas of systems. Powerful idea, right? Um, it's an interesting thing to notice as well that even though it's great to develop expertise, you can end up having some interesting situations happen that um, are not quite as positive. One of them is that Sometimes code in systems ends up becoming bad because the people know it too well. Does that sound like a paradox? Yeah, but it's not really, okay? So imagine you're looking at the same code for three years. You understand it without even looking at it because you've been making changes over and over and over in it. And essentially you can actually let its structure deteriorate and that doesn't even hurt you at all because you just kind of know where everything is. What happens when a new person joins the team? They look at you like you're insane, like, oh my God, how does anybody work on this? It's so horrible, it's so cruddy and stuff like this, right? So essentially the people that are working in an area kind of lose their beginner's mind in a way. Does this have anything to do with Conway's law? I think in a way it does because it kind of points at this intermingling of the human aspect and the software aspect and how they kind of like affect each other. If we're aware of these things, we can do something about them. If we're not, then we deal with the mystery of why does code go bad. Another story, okay? This is really more about process. A story told by um, a guy I know that worked at Microsoft years ago. And what he was talking about to me was essentially, this was kind of like um, as people were getting used to going and doing like continuous integration and things like this that they were working on an operating system and they found that as a developer you could basically make some changes and you check them in, they wouldn't be integrated into the repository fully until about a day and a half later. And they found that quality was suffering. Why would quality suffer? Well, immediately it didn't seem like it would be an issue at all because the reason why it would take a day and a half is they had all these extra checks they would do. They would check it for style, they do model checking to go and make sure concurrency bugs weren't there, elaborate automated test suites, some manual testing and all these things. But it would take a day and a half to go and get feedback about things. And you know, all these things were about going and producing quality in the code. But quality started to suffer as the build times rose. I think we have more awareness now to kind of like see what this is about. And if I have to name it, I think the thing that's best to go and say is that with the lack of feedback, things can kind of fall apart, right? Um, imagine this. Imagine you're a developer on a team that does this, and you're thinking about all the things you need to go and do, and you make the code changes to add a feature in, and then you have all these little changes you can make to make the code better at the same time, little refactorings and stuff. Would you want to put all these pieces together if it's going to take a day and a half to get feedback? Do you want to be the person who basically has their submissions rejected because of things you did to clean up as opposed to things you did just to go and add the feature in. So you prioritize and because of the lack of feedback you end up going and just not doing the things that would make things a bit better over time. Is this related to Conway's, Conway's law? In a process sense. This isn't about team structure affecting code but it's about how the process affects code and has some awkward effects within the context of it. So I think the thing about this is that I've known many people in the industry over years who basically kind of developed this level of intuition about how process and about how organization affects the systems that we work in. But the thing that is really tragic for me is to kind of feel that 
wow, am I going to say this at an Agile conference? I feel like Agile is kind of losing its way. Okay? And I hate to open up this conference with this particular perspective, but there's this interesting thing to go and recognize. Okay? Essentially, when we have conversations in the Agile community, quite often they are, they are like this. Okay? These are all different ways that we can measure success in organizations. And I just pulled this from a blog of a friend of mine. And um, it's interesting when you look at this, how many of these things are about the software itself? A lot of these things are about how to measure work, right? Some things, defects, those are how features can go bad and kind of reflect into the world. But we have things like cycle time, uh, we have like planned versus actual release dates, customer user satisfaction, and all this other stuff. Are we missing a piece here? I don't know, let's think about this a bit more. Lean manufacturing, anybody ever, like you hear of like lean software development and we have Kanban and we have all these other things. We've borrowed a lot in software development and in the agile space from the Toyota production system and all these observations about how to go and basically make manufacturing work very well. And so you'll see these observations all the way through our field. But I think there's an interesting thing to think about as well. When you look at things like work in progress and all these things that we borrow from manufacturing, it's like, well, if you're making cars, perfect, okay? You work on a car, you keep adding to it, adding to it, adding to it. When it gets off the end of the assembly line, what happens? You never see it again, okay? Now, when we try to apply the metaphor to software development, it's like we have features and we do this, we do this, carry features through you know, planning, design, build, test, and then it goes out the door. But the feature, I hate to tell you this, but features aren't real, right? They're real in a way, but features are not a tangible thing that go out the door. Essentially, you are working on code, and the code is going to be there most of the time forever. Okay? So the work that we do, the code that we create, all those things impact your future velocity. And it just seems like we don't pay quite as much attention to this as we quite often should. And I think it has to do with the particular perspective that we have. So for Agile itself, okay, I think Agile has been a wonderful boon to the software development industry. I got involved back in the waterfall days, right? When it was, we were using, it's like, okay, requirements, design, test, the entire ch -ch 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 waterfall. And a lot of people today feel that that was like an imagined, you know, past that was kind of like problematic. Um, it was real, okay, I lived it. I worked in a uh, medically regulated industry where we had to follow those steps. And when Agile came along, you know, me and people I was working with were like very, very happy about the fact that we could sit down and plan our work, do it in short iterations, and kind of move forward and do some great things. But it's an interesting thing. When Agile was first developed through the extreme programming and scrum communities, it kind of settled on a particular way of organizing things. The notion was, here's business and here's development. And what we want to do is we want to establish ground rules so they can communicate well in order to go and solve problems. And that's good, but the way that the ground rules developed was that, okay, business, go ahead and tell development about the features that you want. Development, go and tell business how long it's going to take to do those things. Okay? And so that's the medium of communication quite often in teams. Um, but it's interesting to think about this. Uh, essentially, when you're doing this, when you're paying attention to just those two things, then there's other things you kind of miss. And because you miss those things, they often end up kind of like amplifying an importance. And, you know, quite often I think what happens with this is technical debt. Technical get, debt rises in code bases because we kind of hurry sometimes. We're not basically paying attention to quality metrics within the code itself, within the infrastructure, and going and seeing how those might impact things over time. So, yeah, we've done an awful lot to try to scale things in the community, and that's great. Um, the, the thing I was alluding to back there is something that was first coined by a guy named Joe Spolsky. He calls it the law of leaky abstractions. And the idea is that essentially, anytime you have an abstraction, both in software and in the world, if it becomes non-trivial, then it doesn't encapsulate fully. And I'd kind of argue that what happens in Agile a bit is that when we try to go and say it's about features and estimates, it's about planning, and we aren't paying attention to what's going on in the code, then that comes back with a vengeance, and it ends up being something that we have to go and really deal with deeply. Okay? So technical debt is a bit of a side effect of these things. 
Anybody know what this is at all? There's a house behind that thing, right? Okay. How many people here are developers? Yeah, right. So you kind of know, right? It's like this is what code looks like, right? Code isn't the boxes and lines. It isn't the component diagram that you have. It isn't a set of features. It's a thing that grows, and it grows like a biological organism. And I think that we are just really at the beginning stages of understanding laws of growth in software and how they affect things. But it has to be on the radar. It has to be things that we're thinking about. So it does seem that it's quite easier for us to go and basically maintain, to keep ourselves at this higher space where we basically go and look at things in terms of stories and features and tasks. But then we end up with this thing I call code blindness, which is that we don't talk about the technical things quite as often. How many technical sessions are there at this conference? And I'm not trying to go and make a criticism of this particular conference because I see it all the time. I go to Agile conferences and it's like, occasionally you'll see something about testing, but it's about testing practice. It's not really talking about the technology. Maybe it's just that there are other venues for these things. And maybe it's too much to go and try to sort of like, you know, pull forward from, you know, the idea of, you know, what do people talk about at conferences to what we do back at work. But I still think there's something here to this. So why does this happen? I think one reason is because there's a bit of a cultural disconnect in organizations, okay? And the cultural disconnect is between people that actually deal with, you know, with the code, with the build systems, with DevOps, all these different things, and then sometimes there are the people that just basically deal with the planning end of things, which is a very valuable thing, but the thing that's interesting is that, you know, the people problems, I don't want to say people problems are easy, but we have tools to go and deal with people problems, and they're great. And we can actually work with people and change their mind about things and basically sort of like move things in good ways. You know, there's a lot of deep skill involved in doing this. There are a lot of technical problems that you can't really finesse that way. You can't motivate code towards better behavior. You have to just sit down and actually do these things. You have to actually go ahead and sort of like solve some of these problems. And the thing is that some of these things are not quite as flexible as we might have in different realms. And as a result, if we aren't paying attention to these things, the way that we do them will impact our later work, much like I've pointed out with Conway's Law. Okay? So there are all these dynamics inside of software development that we don't really pay quite as much attention to as we should. Anybody ever hear of this company, ViaWeb at all? Okay? This is a company that developed the very first web application back in the 1990s. So uh, a company started by Paul Graham and a couple of other people. Paul Graham is kind of known for starting Y Combinator, which is, um, they have the Hacker News website, but also they're like an incubator for startups within Silicon Valley. And um, it's very interesting to go and recognize that some problems kind of go away when your scale gets reduced down very small. So a story that he tells is that essentially he was working on the, they were programming in Lisp, this programming language, and he was working with his right hand to go and do some work and doing sales call with his, calls with his left hand going and talking at the same time. So we had to handle sales as well as software development. And you can have this kind of thing where basically people merge roles and just out of necessity in a very small startup. But sometimes when we actually take the roles and we kind of like spread them apart, we end up having like Conway's Law effects, right? We end up going and having to change process and change code because of the way that we segment ourselves into different roles within teams. I think one area where this happens quite often in software development today is the whole notion of front-end developers versus back-end developers. It's kind of like, you know, yes, the technology stacks can be kind of wildly different, but we pay a price for going and saying that we have this strict limit between them. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at some solutions to these things. So I've kind of like outlined a problem and probably sort of like thrown more stuff into the air than, you know, I really should first talk at a conference. Um, but I, I think that for us to go and have the, the perspective that it takes to go and solve some very hard problems in software development, we need to basically actually sort of concentrate on quality matter, matters, not through process as much as through realization of what's really going on within our systems. So this involves surfacing a lot of information. So as I mentioned before, we can kind of look at our systems as being, you know, kind of like living things in a way. And, um, you know, that's just one metaphor that applies. Are cities alive? In some ways they are. Cities kind of grow over time, just like forests do and stuff like this. There are tools out there that can basically show you 
in your code that can basically show you like these rendered landscapes where the height of a box means something and its width means another thing and its length means another thing and then you can see all the classes and modules in your system and get a sense of what the quality happens to be. So those are rather handy tools to be able to use. A thing that I think is really kind of valuable as well is just to go and actually make this information surface within the context of an organization. So typical thing, teams I work with, you see planning proceed in this very familiar fashion. These are the features, developers try to decide how long it's gonna to take to do things, you break them apart, you have conversations back and forth and back and forth. But there's always this thing, this sense that we don't have to tell the business um, what the quality of the software is. We don't have to go and say anything about that. We shouldn't have to because we should keep our technology things under control to the point where we wouldn't have to do these things. But let's look at another possibility here. So here's a bunch of features for a system, okay? Looks like a lot of work, doesn't it? Does it matter what order we do these features in? Yeah, I see a couple of people going and raising their heads. Yeah, yeah, it does, right? But, you know, the orthodoxy we've had in Agile for quite a while is like, no, you determine your minimum viable product, do things in any order, and there's a lot of truth to this. You can basically go in and tackle features in widely different, you know, uh, with widely different priorities over time and still develop very good software. But I think the reality of this is that essentially, um, once a system gets underway, once it kind of grows to a certain point, then there's different impacts for different features in the code. And so, you know, here's an architectural diagram. Does this look like any other architectural diagram you've ever seen? It's kind of funny because it has no lines, right? Just a bunch of boxes. Um, and for the purposes of this diagram, the, the lines are not important at all. Lines in architectural diagrams tell you how things are connected. But what I'm really after with this is going and saying, there's six different areas of code in our system, six different areas of services, these different things. And each of these things is going to be impacted differently by the features that come in. So if we kind of go back, it's kind of like, okay, I might say, okay, I want an inventory report and I want an alternative receipt. And that's going to go and affect inventory and reconciliation and maybe edge, but it won't affect pricer at all, right? So features come out to different areas of the system. Now, the thing is, wouldn't it be great during planning to go and actually give like a health grade to each of these different areas of the system? And then, then you can actually have a conversation about whether certain features should be done now or maybe a little bit later, right? You can make choices about these things. It's a pretty powerful idea. How many people do this, right? Some well-integrated teams will do this kind of thing informally. But to actually have this conversation about, you know, what is the readiness of the system for the addition of these features? Because the system itself is real. We can't gloss it over. Okay? So we can go back and forth about these things. We can sort of like say, okay, well, these are particular features I want. Can some be delayed till later? You know, do we want to add some now? This kind of thing. Just having that kind of stuff on the table is pretty valuable for us. So I call this feature assessment. It's just really a simple name for this practice of going and sort of having this sense of what the system happens to be um, capable of in terms of going and accepting things. And um, I think that in itself, it just surfaces a lot of concerns that we might have in software development. Another thing you can do is something called direction mapping, which is really all about going and sort of like understanding the quality of the code using a couple of different metrics and then trying to go and basically make plans to go and figure out how you're going to go and tackle certain persistent problems. So in this diagram, the x-axis basically is the number of commits a file has had, a source code file in the system. And the y-axis is the complexity. So it's kind of a nice system because a lot of the lines, a lot of the files are clustered towards the origin of this, meaning that they have had very little change and have very low complexity. Isn't there something up in the very upper right-hand corner up there? There's like a little, so that's a file that's been modified, oh gosh, it looks like about 250 times or so. Is that a scary place? That's a very scary place, right? So what do we do about that, right? This is information that we can discover and we may not be able to go and sort of go in there and fix that thing, but what we can do is we can actually have like rules of engagement in a way. We can say, okay, when we are about to go make changes in this area, this is how we want to approach it, change because we know that this is already problematic. And incrementally as we make our changes, we hope to make that better rather than worse. Okay, here's another one. How many people do retrospectives? Great. How often do you talk about how you made design changes in the code? 
No hands. Wow, okay. So this comes back to the cultural disconnect at a very deep level, right? In retros, quite often we have retros with people who you know, are part of the business, you know, part of different teams and stuff like this, and we don't want to bore them. We don't want to go and tell them it's like, yeah, you know, the way I, I sort of like package these things in this different service this way, and it impacts, you know, this thing's like a very large class, I wanted to break it apart, but we can do that later. We don't want to bore people with information like that that they can't really act upon. But we do them a disservice by not talking about these things, not talking about how we did the work, because then it's easy to forget that that work is real, right? That there is this substrate that we basically live in, this thing that it goes and impacts our future development. So actually going and talking about what's going on technologically in the system, talking about our technical choices in retro, a very powerful thing to be able to do, and I encourage you to try doing that. This is a fun one, okay, feature discovery, and it comes right down again to this divide between business and development. You know, it's not hard to go to a person in business and say, please tell me what kinds of things you would want to have in this system. They'll always give you plenty of information about features that they want, right? But the interesting thing is they don't see the system the way that somebody like on the team would, like a tester or a developer. It's like they don't know what's easy to add and what's hard to add. So you can kind of flip things around a little bit. What you can do is just have this thing, like a session. You say, okay, let's take a day today, and all the people on the team, the, develop, the technical people, get together and basically try to think of simple things you could do that might like increase engagement, make the company more money, all these different things. Looking for like low-hanging fruit, looking for easy things to go and add to the system. Now, maybe 90% of the things that they come up with might not work for regulatory reasons or business reasons, but sometimes you might be surprised because essentially they know what's easy. Essentially, people that are outside the software don't know the software well enough to know what's easy. So having this thing of going and bridging the communication that way can be a pretty powerful thing to do. Here's another thing. I don't mean this, literally, but yes, I do. Wait, but I don't, right? Um, I have worked with some organizations where essentially they have kind of merged the role of developers and you know business analysts, and even to a deep level where essentially, you know, the developers are actually making product proposals, doing the marketing research, and writing the code in order to go and do the things that they need to do. Now the thing is, I think there's a limitation to how much any one person can do, how many domains you can become proficient in, but if a lot of the trouble that we have in software development is bridging gaps between people with different roles, then it might be worth having some people on your team that can do both of those things, that can really sort of like serve as a living bridge between different domains. And pretty powerful. The corollary to that is, you know, this. And I don't mean this literally. Wait, no, yes I do. No, I don't. Okay? Um, I don't mean that everybody should code every day and stuff like this, but it, there's great tremendous power and getting people that are part of the business to go and sit down with developers and get a tangible feel for what technical debt is. Understand how they make trade-offs. Understand these different things by sitting there and working with them. Pretty useful. So, kind of coined this term you know, a while back, full spectrum development, which is really all about the notion that you know, we should sort of like try to go and merge roles as much as we can, okay? And not completely, but just enough to go and actually have people aware of what other people are doing. One of the, um, I work with a bunch of different clients, but one of them is basically in the trading domain. And so for financial trading, I've utterly found that utterly fascinating. Um, and at this company years ago, they bought this giant hardcover textbook and paid for training for all their developers to learn the trading domain well, just because they found it so useful for them to understand the domain well, that it's not just the software domain, but it is the business domain, and knowing that stuff is really powerful for them. And I think, you know, for all of us, you know, most of us get into software development because we're really curious people. We enjoy being very curious about things, and there's just a tremendous number of domains we can dig into. So it's worthwhile. So here's another thing, too. When we start looking at how software and systems interact, um, a thing that you can approach, okay, in software development is the notion of going and saying it's not just about going and forming a well-gelled work team and moving them around and having them work in different areas of the code. What if you can actually go and have an organization which has enough skill at forming new teams and disbanding them, that they can do this dynamically in response to different criteria, right? 
You may find that for some particular initiative, it's better to get these five people to work together for three months to go and do something. And then when they're kind of done with that, they can go back to different teams, that kind of thing. Now, you know, the literature on team formation is, um, you know, it's been around for a while and people talk about how hard it is to go and get a good, well-functioning team. But one thing I know as a consultant is, you know, my job when I'm working with people is to learn how to work with people very quickly. And there's no reason why we can't foster that skill within organizations as well, right? If you are working on a team, you've been working on a team for the last five years with the same exact people, you know, I don't care what you think, but things are a bit stale. You aren't having the benefit of other people's experience. You aren't giving your benefit to other people as well. So having this thing where we periodically have people move from team to team is pretty powerful. Another thing, okay, essentially when we're thinking about things that we can do in software that, you know, kind of have an organizational impact. You know, I've talked for quite a while about going and actually deleting code. I don't think deleting code is really the answer. You know, deleting code that isn't really being used all that well. But we ought to periodically be going and looking at what are the features in our systems that aren't really being used or basically produce very little value. And if we can actually get rid of those pieces, you know, we can actually go ahead and delete code along with it and basically make the work experience inside the system far easier than it would be otherwise. Now, the reason this kind of relates back to the business and development divide is that, you know, from a business point of view, it's very hard to go and see that the more features that you have, the more difficult things are, right? You don't really see those impacts right away. You just keep on adding features and adding features, then slowly you discover that it takes longer and longer to add features as you've added more and more. But to the degree that some of these are really low value features, developers will stumble over code that doesn't need to be there all the time. And when they do this, it just takes longer to understand what's going on in the system, it takes longer to modify it, and it just slows everything down. So it's again another thing that we can kind of look at. Rotating people between teams, that's kind of like the light version of dynamic reteaming. You know, just going and saying that let's set things up so that maybe a person can't be a member of a team for more than nine months before they go off to another team. So you get the benefit of other people's experience and they get the benefit of your experience. Okay, and here's another one which I think is kind of funny because it gets back to that whole thing of like, what is the reality of the software in our system? Um, system stakeholders, right? You've done stakeholder analysis maybe in your organization. Understand who are the users of the system and stuff like that. What if we considered the software real? What if we considered the software itself as a stakeholder in the system? So I've actually carried this to a degree where we'll do like role playing on a team, right? So somebody will stand up and they'll say, I'm the pricing strategies of the system. Oh, I am basically the gateway to the secondary system. And they'll stand up and they'll say, oh, I don't feel very good today because of the changes that happened three weeks ago, right? So it sounds kind of fluffy and interesting and stuff like this, but we can get benefit from actually like um, anthropomorphizing, considering the reality of the systems, imagining even that they had feelings, even though we know that software doesn't have feelings. If it did, we'd behave differently, right? So considering these things to be real is pretty powerful. Okay, one of the close to the next to the last one here, Quality views, okay, this is kind of like that feature list, mapping it against different areas of code type thing, but kind of carried a bit further. Um, a guy I know working at Tesla in the US has taken this idea and kind of gone forward with it. When they're doing planning, he basically has a color-coded you know, diagram of the architecture. And the darker the color is, the less healthy that area of the code happens to be. And so he just puts it on the wall and they discuss features, they talk about what the impacts of features are in different areas. And what's interesting is that he never talks about technical debt. But periodically, the people he's planning with, they go and they say, yeah, you know, it seems like this area over here is very red. It's like, what can we do to make that lighter? And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, there's things we can do to go and basically make these things better and st stuff like this. So technical debt is a metaphor. It's kind of useful. But essentially, just the visualization, the reality of the system can lead you to make better choices when you're uh, looking at how things might impact the code. So, yeah. I guess the base end of this is that we have to basically learn how to tend the code a bit better. We have to kind of recognize that, you know, it's, it's like it's alive, right? And it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, we are the caretakers of this stuff. We can't pretend it's not there. If we do, it hurts us over time. Okay? And um, in organic systems, we just have a lot of piecemeal growth. You know, code is like biology. I don't think I've got enough time to go and really dig into how deep that 
knowledge goes. I'd say it's more than metaphor. I think it's just a, a physical reality that code and biology are very similar things. And um, yeah, maybe the best way for us to go and look at our systems is um, as symbiosis, symbiotic, right? You know this word, symbiosis? Okay, essentially you have different life forms that live together. You know, essentially this, uh, this is a clownfish. I'm not really up on fish, right? Um, apparently they evolved along with sea anemones in such a way that they provide value to the sea anemone and consequently there's nothing about the poison of sea anemone that goes and affects the clownfish. So they get to live together and they get to basically sort of like feed each other and nurture each other and stuff like this. Organizations can be this way, right? Essentially the technical systems can be things that we take care of. And you know, it's pretty good that we take care of the technical systems because I think in our hearts we all kind of know what happens when we don't. We end up having to go and make decisions forced by technology. We have to change the way we work because of the technology that we've produced. And at a certain level, it becomes in control of us and in control of our process. And the way that happens is when we're just not paying enough attention to it. So software shapes our business. So the shape of our software is vital information. And um, I hope that this becomes a bigger part of the conversation in agile software development. Because it's not just about us. The systems that we work on really, really matter. They impact us, the lives that we have at work, and the lives of everybody else that we touch. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. The, green, uh, the greenery, which seemed like cancerous code, um, but you know, sometimes code can also be a, a rose bush that can spike you, but uh, it can be beautiful too. Um, I think we have some time for some questions, or not? Do we? I think we do. Does anybody want to take any, right. any questions of Michael? I'll run up with a the microphone. There we go. I know you had a training yesterday. Uh, yeah. My name is Katerina. I'm from Extra Energy Cyprus. Uh, do you have any trainings that you help companies to overcome these kind of problems? Because you're like uh, shooting right on the target. Uh, <laughs> still every, every of your word is like... Uh, well, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because like, I didn't like introduce myself at the beginning of this, but I wrote a code over 10 years ago called working effectively with legacy code, right? Which is all about getting yeah, yeah, yeah. tests in place to refactor systems and stuff like that. And a lot of what I just presented is really a lot of reflection based upon work that I've done with teams to go and make these problems better. Um, yeah, I, I do training around this. It's, uh, I think I'm still at the raising awareness stage with a lot of these things in terms of going and how do we bridge communication with the organization and the technology itself. But yeah, I do. So. so how we can invite you? <laughs> oh, okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, just michael.feathers at gmail.com. Easy. So. Okay, thanks okay. a lot. Sure. It was great. You're welcome. Let's take one or two more. If we have them. Yeah. Uh, I'll, he had his hand up first. You'll go straight after. I'm fast. Uh, I, an observation uh, in terms of this um, discussion between component and feature teams is that... Uh, it's very usual to observe this in operating systems and platforms mm -hmm. where you need experts to build a component yep. and then other people to reuse in features. So it's prevailing in operating system companies and platform companies. Yeah. And there's no either or answer to that. No, that's, that's definitely true. Making platform versus you know, the, uh, the over systems. It's funny because in the move to microservices, you know, quite often some of these things, it feels like we have a bit more focus than we did with like feature teams and component teams. But I think that the same tension between what do we optimize for in different areas of the system persists regardless of the approaches that we use. I think my main thing with this is just going and saying, you know, you may choose to have a platform, you may choose to go and have these other things, but make these decisions consciously, know what to look for in terms of what they might affect, and be able to take mitigating action when you find that, you know, as a side effect of doing platform, you have like maybe a, a disconnect. What do you do to bridge that? You have more cooperative work groups between the teams, stuff like this. So it's, it's really about, it's about getting that awareness across, I think is the main thing. And so. one way of mitigating for that is to have tour of duties where you move people from yeah. features to... rotation. I, th I think it's a tough thing in organizations quite often politically to move people from one place to another or to let them move from pl one place to another. But I'm optimistic because I'm seeing more organizations where they'll do things like, okay, you know, here's the entire engineer engineering organization you decide where you're going to work by talking to your coworkers, and you get to move wherever you need to based, you know, it's a great deal of uh, trust that the engineering organization will decide where the best place to be, where your talents lie, and that kind of thing. 
Um, but I, I think a lot of that, it takes a very enlightened organization to move that far. I think at the very least, even if we haven't gone that far, moving people or allowing people to move you know, for specific reasons is a great first step. So. Thank you, Michael. Final one, 10 seconds. Hmm. Okay, I will be fast. Having a Scrum Master in the team that is technical and it has a hybrid role, it's a big challenge, right? So again, team so having a Scrum Master in the team that has a hybrid role to do coding as well and Scrum at the same time. How do you get a Scrum Master to? Having a Scrum Master in a hybrid role. Yes. You said that everybody in the team should code, right? Yeah, you know, it's, well, it's, yeah, it's doable. You know, I think that actually... It, uh, uh, but the big challenge here is to avoid micromanaging. That, yeah, to uh, avoid micromanaging. You know, I, how, do, thing, how, how do you foresee, foresee this? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's, that's an issue. I think it really comes down to good, uh, good training and resources for people that are moving from a technical role to a role where they're responsible for other people's work. And uh, that's the thing. When you have your, your value in your mind as my technical ability, then it's hard to go and actually sort of step back sometimes and let other people lead on technological items. And I think that's a thing that, you know, in the industry, we, we, we're doing better at that sort of thing. I think there are more resources for people doing that kind of thing. Uh, but it, that is a transition that people make. So, okay. Michael, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Awesome. So before we move along.